Good morning, everybody. Bert, can I get you to close that door there, please, sir? Thrilled to have everybody today. It looks like we may be a little down. I don't know if that's uh, people being gone from the holidays or, or maybe the virus. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But anyway, we're glad all of you all are here and excited to worship God this morning. By way of announcements, I'm sure all of you are used to it by now, but the communion supplies are in the back, both the bread and the cup, and also the offering plates are back there, so if you need to use those, they're back there. Um, I'll mention again the daily devotionals that are now on the, the church's website with Burke's input. Uh, those are something to really enjoy if you would like to do that. Um, those that may be mentioned that need prayers for being sick. But Brother Richard Lively, he may he's not sick, but he's had some testing done and we'll find out in about a week it, in that the, when you go back just what the story is with Richard's health, so we need to remember that. Uh, our brother Bo Chancellor is in the hospital as we seek with as we speak with his blood sugar it is out of control, but I think they have a handle on that now, maybe so. We need to remember Bo. Cheryl Putman's sister, Mary Ross, is still in the hospital with the problem that she's had in the past and it's been very serious, but they think maybe they have a handle on that, but we need to remember Mary in prayer. On a brighter note, Greg and Terry McKee, probably in the city right now, they're new grandparents. That information about that is in the bulletin. And also Keith Gerlock found out he's gonna be a, a new grandparent. Kelsey, his daughter, is gonna have a little girl and he mentioned that to us, so we need to remember all of that. Now, about the virus. I'm sure all of you have heard or know that Cordell has kind of been exposed to a potentially dangerous situation. So I wanna caution all of you again, if you wanna wear your mask, do it. Yeah, especially if you're going to be conversing closely with other people. So let's remember the social distancing and remember if you're in close proximity, you might need to be outside if you want to visit or something. And if you want to wear a mask, let's feel free to do so. Um, I think that's all I have in the way of announcements this morning. Does anybody else have a need or something that needs to be said? If not, let, let's begin our worship service with a word of prayer, please. Almighty God, we're so grateful for the beauties of this life that you have provided. We're thankful this morning for the rain. We ask more if it be in accordance with your will. We thank you, dear Lord, for our great country, for our families, for this congregation and the church worldwide, dear Lord, we pray your blessings on all of that. We want to pray this morning for Richard and for Bo and for Mary Ross. Please, dear Lord, give them health and hope and strength and happiness as only you can. For the McKees and their new grandchild and uh, Keith Gerlock and his new one coming, we, we pray your blessings on them. Dear Lord, we pray your blessings on this town and this country as this virus has a grip, but we know all things you have a handle on, and so we trust in you. But we pray, dear Lord, if it's in accordance with your will, that this problem might be quickly alleviated. Please be with us now as we worship. Please be with us each and every day as we attempt to do your will and that we may be servants of all men and with kind and tender spirits and hearts as we deal with those about us. Please bless us in moments of temptation. We beg forgiveness of our sins. These things we pray through Christ, amen. Number 714 will be our first song. 714, men sing with me, women the echo. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So shall my peace save from my enemies. The Lord liveth, and let's be the rock, let God of my salvation be exalted. 
in prayer. Shall we pray? Our most gracious and wonderful God, we come to you this morning knowing the love and the care that you have for each and every one of your children, knowing the love that we have for you, Father, as you guide our lives, as you direct us in the way that we should go, as we go through these things, Father, that make us wonder what's going to happen or what we're going to do, may we realize, Father, that if we ask for the wisdom that you have and that you want to give to us, that this will seem like something that we shouldn't worry all about that much. Because we know, Father, that you know what to do. And we know that you have said that you will take care of those and love those and do what is best for those that love you. So we ask you this morning, Father, to give us wisdom, to help us realize, Father, that when we turn everything over to you and we stop trying to do it ourselves, that the greatest things will come forth and that we will see your honor and your glory 
above all things because we know and we trust in you. Be with this congregation. Be with its leaders. Help us to always try and make the right decisions, Father, so that your word, so that your name is revered and honored above all names. Help us to realize, Father, that it is not what we do. It is how we follow your incredible word that will make the difference. We thank you so much for having your hand on all of those who are sick and who are hurting, for being with those who are lonely and without. Help us to realize, Father, there is so much more that we can do with your help for all of those who are without. Help us to realize, Father, the need for the love that we should have for each other that there is nothing that should stand in the way of us caring and loving each other. Help us to lose our pride, Father, and to realize it's not about us individually. It's about Jesus Christ and his death on the cross because of his incredible love for us. Be with us, Father. Help us to pay attention today to the word that Ken will bring to us. May it have something to do with us in our lives and hearts so that we can take that and take it out to others and share that word. We must always do that, Father. Never stop sharing your word with others. We love you. We thank you so much for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who died on the cross for our sins. May we always remember this day, Father. And we thank you for your presence here today and for your presence within our hearts. We love you so much, Father. And we ask all these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Psalm before the lesson in the communion service number 278, 278. Good job. 
closing invitation song will be number 210. 210. Well, it does appear that we have uh, many who are visiting with us this morning. I suspect most of you visiting with us are from the 4th of July holiday that we've just experienced. Whatever the case is, we're really, really glad that you're here with us this morning. In fact, I'm glad that everyone is here. I, uh, I typically never tie my lesson uh, to a holiday. Almost never. Once in a while at Christmas time, once in a while other times, but almost never do that. But today I'm going to uh, take a break from the life of David, and I'm going to try to at least tie a little bit of what I want to say from the, uh, the idea of our 4th of July holiday or Independence Day, or at the heart of all that is the idea of freedom. And it's easy to say that as Americans, we love freedom. Is that kind of right? We love freedom. But I don't think it's just Americans. I, I think people all over this world want freedom from undue restriction, undue constraint. Everybody wants freedom from that. And so I want to try to talk about that for a little while this morning. But I need you to do what Ron prayed. I need you to really listen from beginning to end. Because if you don't listen from beginning to end, you might take a sliver of what I say and misunderstand, and that's, I don't want that to happen. In reality, what I'm going to address needs several weeks or a couple of months or a bunch of classes, but I at least want to whet your appetite with it. I, I, I want to talk about the freedom that we have within the kingdom of God. The freedom within the kingdom of God. And, and I want to begin by just reminding you that when Jesus ascended into the heavens, shortly thereafter, the good news of Jesus began to be preached. Now, the good news of Jesus, you know, is this idea of the death and the burial and the resurrection and, and the forgiveness of sins that can come to all of us through the gift of Jesus Christ. The forgiveness of sins gives us freedom from the guilt and the penalty of our own sins. We, we know that part of the story. But I'm talking about after we become members of the kingdom. So the good news of Jesus was preached. You know in this audience that in that day and time there were two general groups of people. One was very small group. That small group was what we called Jews. They had a long, long history, didn't they, of a relationship with God. It would trace all the way back to Abraham. And they had all that law that had been given through Moses with all those massive numbers of commands. And they had developed all these traditions related to that law. And now they hear the good news about Jesus Christ and they become convicted of their own sins, at least some of them do, and they become convicted that Jesus really was the one sent from God. He was the Savior. He was the Messiah. And they make a response to that and they commit to change their lives and they're baptized into this new kingdom. Now the other group was much larger in number. Because the other group is everyone who is not a Jew. They're called Gentiles. The amazing thing about this new kingdom, of which we are a part, is that these Gentiles 
were able to hear the same kind of preaching as the Jews heard. And so they too were convicted of their own personal sin. And they were convicted that Jesus really was. They believed that Jesus really was sent by God Based on the love of God and the graciousness of God, He sent His own Son, and they believed that He died to pay the price for their sins, and they made the exact same response as did the Jews. They made a commitment to change the way they lived their lives, and they were baptized into this new kingdom. Now, a little bit of time passes, and these Jewish Christians begin and perhaps with good intentions, make sure you underline that, perhaps with good intentions, they began to say to the Gentile Christians, kind of like this, if you want to be a really good Christian, if you want to be a really spiritual Christian, then you need to follow some of these things that have been so important for so very long to God, like circumcision." or like the Sabbath day rules and traditions, or like keeping a special holy day, like a new moon day. And you need to follow the dietary laws and abstain from certain things if you really want to be really good with God. Now, there's one writer in the New Testament that learns about this. His name is Paul. And he becomes very, very strong. Very strong. He, he writes the book of Galatians. He writes the book of Colossians. He writes the book of Romans. All about this issue. But the real issue he writes about is the issue of freedom within the kingdom of God. He's writing about freedom. And so that's why he'll say in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, for example, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free, so don't return to these rules made by men. That's interesting that he calls them rules made by men now. It's in Colossians chapter 2 I want to bring your attention to this morning, at least as we begin, because Paul will say to these Gentile Christians concerning the undue restriction that the Jewish Christians are trying to place upon them. He will say, for example, in Colossians chapter 2, we'll begin in verses 10 and 11. He'll say concerning circumcision. In Him, that is in Christ, you were circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self, ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ having been buried with Him in baptism, in which you were raised with Him through your faith in the working God who raised Him from the dead. Wow. He, he says, you know what? The sign of a covenant with God in the old days was given to Abraham as circumcision. He said now, he takes it for granted, the sign that you have become a member of the kingdom of God is through your baptism. You were raised. And he goes ahead to say, a little bit later, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you, condemn you, urge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival or a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. He says these rules are later. Do not handle and do not touch and do not taste. They're, they're all of this world. And if you engage in those, you are limiting your freedom. So he's saying to Gentiles, don't let anyone come along and say to you, you have to do this or that to be a really good Christian. But you know, time passes. This is really important. Time passes, and the Gentile Christians begin to mature. And they begin to see, I don't, I don't need to do all those things. But now they look at the Jews. Years later, the book of Romans is written. They look at the Jews who are still in their Christianity celebrating certain special days, abstaining from certain meats, doing certain things like that. And they look at the Jews and say, 
in a judging kind of way, you shouldn't be doing that. You don't need to do that. And Paul gets equally, equally strong, equally upset with such language. Because those Gentile Christians are now doing the same thing to the Jews that the Jews had done to them. They were robbing them of their freedom. Now this is why you need to listen really carefully, okay? Because Paul is going to say, if they want to set aside a special day, that's between them and God. They're doing it in their heart for God. If they want to stop eating certain things, what does that hurt? That's between them and God. It's not your business to try to tell them not to do those things. They are free to do those things. And you're probably thinking at this point, well, why in the world would you spend a 4th of July weekend when people are tired talking about something like this? Because we don't have those problems. Everyone in this audience, with exception of my daughter, eats meat. And she eats a little bit. Okay? But she thinks it's not healthy. Every time I eat meat, she says, Daddy, that's too much. Now she's got my wife saying it. You know? But over time, the principle remains the same. The issues have just changed. Over time, people have continually tried to say to other Christians within the kingdom, in essence, if you want to be really a good Christian, if you really want to be a spiritual Christian, then you should do this or you shouldn't do that. Is anybody kind of aware of that? I'm told, I don't, I don't know this, but I'm told a long time ago before my time that there were Christian people who would say to other Christian people, if you play cards, that's probably not good because that's worldliness that you're letting into your life. Does anybody remember in Cordell that there used to be a pool hall? Now, I... It was on the east side of the square, between the square and the stoplight. It was on the south side of the road, and you're wondering, how do I know this so well? Uh, and, and as a young boy, I was kind of led to believe that you shouldn't probably go into the pool hall. I went. I want to learn how to play pool. Now, all I ever saw were pool tables and a bunch of old men that were probably younger than I, but a bunch of old men sitting back at the back of tables. And yet I had kind of been led to believe that I shouldn't be doing that. Now this list can go on and on. I can keep you here till 1 o'clock. But as time rocks along, somewhere along the way, a guy in Chicago invented something called Sunday school. A guy in Chicago. Because he wanted to get the, the kids off the streets on Sunday mornings and do something that might help them with God, and so he invented a school on Sunday. And there were people who began to say, but you, you, if you really want to do things right with God, you probably shouldn't have Sunday school or Bible classes. Good intentions, but we work past that. Then there were people who said, you really shouldn't have a fellowship hall or a kitchen. And there's this little verse in the book of 1 Corinthians that says, don't you have a house to eat and drink in? And we kind of worked past that. And then people started building larger fellowship halls and larger kitchens. And some of them would put basketball goal in there so the young people could have something to kind of spend their time there. And they begin to say, oh, that's going too far because that's on the line of entertainment and you shouldn't be doing that if you're really a, a good, faithful Christian. And on and on and on it goes of within the kingdom, people trying to say 
if you really want to be spiritual, if you really want to be, then you should not or you should do. And from what I can tell in the New Testament, Paul comes up in arms against such thinking. And he says, don't you understand in the kingdom there is enormous freedom? Such great freedom that I'm convinced that if this world out here who is starved to be free from undue restriction and undue constraint, if they could see the freedom practiced correctly within the body of Christ, they would come and the buildings would be full everywhere. And you're probably thinking, okay, are you saying anything goes? No, of course not. I mean, we've seen throughout the course of history, yes, there have been dictators and there have been governments and there have been employers and there have been masters and there have been families who have put undue restrictions upon people. Unnecessary. Makes life harder. Makes life miserable. But you have to have some, don't you? Every organization has to have some. So what are they in the Lord's church? What are they in the kingdom of God? You know, you know how it says in the New Testament that we as Christians are to obey? We're to obey. Within the kingdom of God, we're to obey. Have you ever tried to list what it is we're to obey? Two things. Two things in the kingdom of God govern, restrict us. The law of love and the law of morality. There may be another, but I'll tell you this about the law of love. If we ever learn the law of love properly, 90, 95, 97, 98, 99% of our lives, everything we basically do will be governed by the law of love because it teaches me how to talk or not to talk about other people. And the law of love restricts the selfishness that I might let grow in my heart. And the law of love restricts pride. And the law of love demands compassion and kindness to the point that I am forgiving. And the law of love will say that if I find someone who is in need, that out of mercy I will help. And the law of love says that I ought to listen to your opinions and maybe even put your opinions more important than my own. The law of love governs so much of how you and I are supposed to live within the kingdom. And yes, there's a law of morality. It covers a little bit of that in life. Do you know, do you know how many arguments we've had on how we dress And the only thing the Bible really says about dress, really says, is you dress morally. It's the law of morality that governs that. Oh, I, I know it talks about dressing with gold braided in your hair and getting all flashed up, you know, so that people pay more attention to the outside than the inside. By the way, this mask deal, people are really encouraging me to wear a mask, but not for health reasons. They just say, I look better. You know, so it's bothering me. So, uh, the law of morality might well have stopped me from going to the pool hall if it was really a bad spot. Do you know that? The law of morality says to me where I might go, where I might not go. The law of morality may govern what I let my eyes see and my ears hear. And the law of morality might most definitely cover the viewpoint that I take and the responsibility I have in regard to those of the opposite gender. What a kingdom. What a kingdom where we are free and we don't impose upon others our own particular slant on these things so as to take away their freedom and instead we replace it with living in love and living morally. And do you realize when that happens, when we embrace the freedom of the New Testament, 
and we live a life of love, and we live a life of morality, do you know the lights begin to shine, and people see, and people will then, by definition of the text, be drawn, be drawn to what we have. So I hope we never find ourselves trying to convince others if you really want to be spiritual, you need to do this or you need to do that or you shouldn't do this. That we might preserve the freedom for which Jesus died in his kingdom. I really hope we'll be people who embrace the law of love with all our heart of obedience and the law of morality with all our heart of obedience. Now hold that for a moment and think about that. I want us to go into our Lord's Supper. We say a lot about it these days. It means a lot of different things to us. At the heart of this law is the word, at the heart of this communion is the word freedom. God did send His Son. He most certainly died on a cross. He was raised from the dead that I might be free from the sins that I commit. And I've got a bunch of them. And He gave me freedom from the guilt and the penalty of all that. And I'm supposed to remember that. What a, what a beautiful thing that Christ designed a life of freedom for me. And He designed for all of us a kingdom where we live like this. What a beautiful thing that Jesus has done. So as we take the communion today, maybe remember just how special just how truly special this environment of the kingdom is that he gave to us. Let's let's take that now. Before we take the Lord's Supper and Communion, I'd like to read just a quick verse of Scripture, and I appreciate Gary's example to start this. Read with me if you would, or I will read to you. 1 John chapter 4, verses 9 through 12. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. If you would, bow with me, please. Our dear Heavenly Father, how awesome thou art. We thank you so much, O God that you are mindful of us, that you love us, that you sent your Son to die for our sins. Be with us now as we remember the love and the sacrifice that was made for our sins as we partake of this loaf which represents that broken body. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our dear Heavenly Father, we continue our prayer at this time, remembering, remembering the love that you have for us, remembering the freedom we have from sin, remembering that we have an eternal home with thee in heaven. Help us always to put that first and foremost in our minds as we partake of this emblem which represents the blood given in our stead. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Well, I may regret a lot of things about this lesson, but what I might regret is the pool hall story because my dad is back there on the back row and he probably didn't know I was at pool hall. So, but, uh, What God really wants, what God really wants is for all people in this world to believe the story about his son Jesus and to believe his great love that Greg just read about. And what he really wants is for people to, because they believe all that, to change their lives and to be immersed into this new kingdom. And what he really wants is for people in this new kingdom to live a life of love and morality. And again, I will tell you, it'll make a difference. Our country is in trouble. Our country's in big trouble. Part of the reason we're having so much trouble is that people are tired of undue restriction. That's just a little part of it. But I'm convinced that the only thing that can really, truly turn this country around I haven't seen a political party yet that can do it. I don't believe they can completely turn it around. But I believe that God, through His Son, having people who will live as free people, sincerely loving and abiding by the law of morality, I believe it can change everything. I hope you are committed to that and have been a part of that, either by becoming a member or living like a free member in the body of Christ. So we're going to sing our final song. Out of tradition, we sometimes call it an invitation song, only a tradition. But it is a convenient time if anybody needs anything to make that to be known. Let's, let's stand while we do sing this final song. His old way to trust is Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus said the Lord, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, out service. Father, we come before you to give you honor and glory. And thank you for the freedom we have, especially the freedom with Jesus. Please bless us, protect us, keep us all healthy and safe. Be with our country and our leadership and help us as we travel home. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.